I acted needy and I pushed my wife away. Now, what do I do? That's our topic here on today's live tribe call. I acted needy and pushed her away. Now what? Now, we can't read her mind unless she straight up told you you're being needy. But what we are concerned about is the lack of connection. She's not talking with us as much anymore. She seems nasty, maybe even when we're in the room together, or she straight up told you she wants nothing to do with you right now. It's confusing. What do I do? How can I fix this? That's the spot that I've been in and many men are in right now. I acted needy and pushed her away. We're going to go through these three bullet points today. Don't make the number one mistake most guys make here. I've seen this mistake over and over and over every week, every year. I've been doing this work, this very simple mistake. Number two is how do I get intimacy back on track to bedtime fun? And number three, how do I help her trust me more? Jeff, can you give me an easy mindset hack for that? And the answer is yes, absolutely. I can do that. So welcome to this live tribe call. We've been doing these calls since the beginning of the pandemic because we as men have felt very alone, very alone, especially when relationships are troubled or relationship is maybe even in the, in the tank or it feels like it's in the tank right now. We just had the holidays. It's January 6th of 2024. And a lot of men I know that I work with were crossing their fingers one way or the other through the holidays or holding their breath or wondering what was going to happen. And I want to hear more of your stories here today. Absolutely. If you want to reach out to me or any of the coaches within Good Guys to Great Men or Great Men Move Mountains, there's links on your screen right there. I'll put some more in the chat as we get going here today. So I definitely want to hear your stories. To, to prime us for me bouncing over to you gentlemen here, I'm going to ask you, have you been in a spot where you've come across as needy? Do you feel like you're being needy right now? Where are you confused? I want to hear your story. I want to hear your questions. And as a primer, I've been thinking about this call. I've been thinking about you men for many days leading up to this. I was at the gym this morning and this song by Three Days Grace came on. I was jamming out to it and I thought, hell, some of these lyrics will be phenomenal to get us started for today. It starts with every day I'm just surviving. Keep on climbing the mountain. Even when I feel like dying, I keep climbing the mountain. Another night, I'm barely holding on, one step away from being dead and gone. Am I alive to die another day? Is this life that I've been living all that's meant for me? I'm just surviving, I keep climbing. Even when I feel like dying, I keep climbing the mountain. Every time I think I'm over it, I wake up in the bedroom, I wake up in the bottom of it all again. I'm still surviving, keep climbing, keep climbing the mountain. The higher I go, the harder I fall, so I don't look down. I don't look back at all. And when I wish it would all turn to black, I try to see the light and push the darkness back. And so we are here to see the light, so to speak, of who you are as a man, who you are on the inside, regardless of what her face looks like, regardless of her emotions today, if she's upset or happy or ignoring you, whether sex is happening or not, who are you as a man? And I believe absolutely to keep climbing that mountain every day, even if we feel like dying, right? Because we want to show up for what? What do we want to show up for? Who we are on the inside, our kids, our family, our future, those that rely on us, but also for ourselves. And what does that mean for our own selves? These are questions I ask myself every day. And I talk with men about every single day in my practice. So gentlemen, I want to hear your stories. Come on in. Do you feel like you've been needy recently? Do you feel like uh, you have a particular question you want to ask or put on the table for the men? Come on in. I'll mute yourself and come on in. I'll go ahead and start. Yeah, Dan, um, please go for it. Yeah. So I have been in a process that uh, has actually been very insightful for me. Um, because I am doing two things. I am recognizing where my neediness is and has been, you know, communicated. And I'm also realizing that it's not all about me. And the uh, separation that we're doing right now is called a healing separation because we don't have any intention of being divorced, but we're living apart, taking time for ourselves and our own work. And it's, you know, it was tough for me at the beginning due to my, uh, my style of, of, uh, being sort of too connected. Um, but now that we've had a few weeks into this, I'm really appreciating it. And it's it's giving me the clarity that I need and also allowing her to, to get clarity as well. 
But I recognize um, in those two categories um, that one is, is that I've expressed my neediness um, in ways that I wasn't fully conscious of, um, that there are a lot of ways that I sort of expected her to self-regulate or to regulate my emotional state that I think is an unreasonable expectation of a partner. And I think a lot of us men do, because um, that's kind of a societal role and a family role that women have. Um, and so I've really been able to see that with the distance. Um, the other thing is to recognize that there's always a lot going on in someone else, uh, especially our wives, that you know has nothing to do with us. And we sometimes have a tendency to to fixate on her 100% reaction as if it's 100% about us. And what I'm finding is it's a real mixed bag, and that's true for all of us. Um, so really, I'm just want to want to share and encourage everybody that you, I think we need to understand our own neediness and how we communicate that sometimes without being aware of it. And also, um, you know, the fact that that it's not all about us and she has her own emotional process that we tend to co-opt or think is is too much about us. Yeah, Dan, that, that's very well said. So give us maybe a specific example. What was one of the most, let's say, difficult situations or what have you realized where you used to go to her to take care of you, so to speak, emotionally, and now you're doing that for your own self? What's one of the most difficult spots? Um, okay, let's see. Um, probably what I have recognized with the distance that we have that's good is that just I, I would have a tendency to kind of use her as a security blanket um, in the sense of connection, physical contact with her, all those sort of things in an unreasonable way, you know, without standing enough on my own process and my own two feet it would be an easy default when I was feeling down for another reason completely, or I was feeling, you know, out of sorts or whatever to, to go and seek that from her. And that felt very burdening to her for good reason, because when you're expecting somebody else to, to fill your cup, you know, as your default comfort system. Um, so, you know, if I had a bad day at work, if I had, you know, some challenge in some other world or whatever, you know, I would essentially run to her with that kind of neediness. And again, didn't even recognize I was doing that. Um, and now with the separation um, that we've had, you know, I'm having to manage those emotions on my own without that. And I'm very consciously making a decision not to burden her with lots of texts or, you know, whatever the case is. Um, and that's that's really what I've responded internally with that is having a sense of sort of relaxation you know, as opposed to being this sort of needy, quick, knee-jerk reaction. Um, so that's that's been very, very helpful. Yeah. So let me ask, let's make it as real as possible, right? So what sure. what comes over you? What's this, oh, I really want to talk to her and unload. What comes over you? What's the thought? And what, do you do, what are you doing now instead of going to her? Instead, okay. Um, yeah, as I, as I look back, you know, and we've been married 33 years, so this has been a long history of, of my particular style of doing this. And again, it wasn't, I, I guess I didn't characterize it as neediness because I didn't approach in, in ways that I would have gone, oh, you're being needy. Um, to me, it was sort of like, you know, this expectation. Um, and, you know, like I said, if there was a, a situation, you know, in whatever way that I felt off balance or out of sorts, I would go, you know, and and essentially seek solace from her in that. And there's a, a certain amount of that that I think is healthy and reasonable, but but I was doing it in, you know, what I would call a codependent way, as I understand some of the language now. Um, and what I'm doing instead, not having that, you know, go to, is I'm finding other things that I can do. So one of the things that I do is I have a um, I have an inversion table. And I find that if I put my feet in that thing and lie back and just stretch and let my spine, you know, relax and everything that I can sort of self-regulate down like that. Um, I'll jump on the treadmill or hit the bow flex or something. So physical activity I found is very, very helpful. Um, the other thing is, is I have an amazing stereo system and part of the separation <laughs> is I get, to, I get to listen to it as loud as I want now, um, you know, <laughs> and, and so I just will sit down and you know listen to an hour of really really loud wonderful music um and just allow that to do it so i'm i'm finding other mechanisms and i think as we re-engage sometime in the future we don't have a timeline for that but it, you know we're thinking somewhere in the two to four month kind of range um that i'll be able to to use those mechanisms instead of defaulting back into 
well-worn patterns that make her feel really burdened by by my needs yeah i i love it so kick-ass music and kicking ass in the gym and being upside down <laughs> hanging up to down. good good so let me, perspective, yeah. yeah let me let me ask one more question again because i'm actually curious for your sake and this applies to every single man here if we were doing a one-on-one -on -one, i'd be asking you know dan this same question so i asked do you do you have a particular thought you, your answer was great but you missed do you have a particular thought that's really triggering for you like i'm alone and do you have a feeling inside of you like oh my god i need to vomit this out to someone and so when you do see your wife again, uh -huh. or when you move back, when you move back together again, or hopefully you renew your relationship, you know, or the next woman, you'll, you'll know what your most difficult thought is and your most difficult feeling is where you don't go run to her. Um, I, okay. To be, to be very disclosing, the feeling I, I think is tied into a sense of, of abandonment or, you know, needing someone to regulate um and and so that's the feeling that i have common it's it's kind of pit of the stomach heart zone yeah you know as, far as, as the somatic feeling of it um is sort of like you know a sense of emptiness or or that you like know hunger that, yeah it's a it's a hunger um but it's it's like a it's an energy drop and so yeah. what i what i feel is like a hollowness and where you know previously I would engage with her to get that sense of being filled up somehow, um, sometimes in in angry ways, you know, which I love Terry Real when he talks about angry pursuit is really never effective. <laughs> um, um, and I've and I've really had that experience is that, you know, if I'm agitated and angry about something and feel that hollow feeling, it's like the combination of those two things just really brings on that sense of neediness. So that's how I that's how I feel the feeling. And what I'm doing now is, you know, looking at, at a variety of different ways to offset that. So I recognize the feeling and then I take action. And so, you know, whether it's more of a passive action, like listening to music or whether it's active, like working out or whatever, it just, it's, it's really, really working. And, and I find that I can shift it, you know, sometimes within, you know, just a couple minutes. Yeah. I love it. You said it's really working and that was going to be my, yeah. my final thing. It sounds like, yeah. Does it, does it feel more empowering for you? It seems like it. Yeah. It feels empowering and it feels very confident, you know? Yeah. And, and so that's, that's really, I think what has been kind of the silver lining of all this and the surprise is like, Oh, uh, I'm, I'm capable of this. And as you know, as long as we have something that is an easy go-to that we have been conditioned um, to engage with, then, you know, that's what we do, you know, and that speaks for addictions and all sorts of other things like that. Um, but you know, we can be addicted to people too and dynamics within relationship and, and not having that being separated from, you know, my junk, so to speak, um, you know, not being able to shoot up easy with, with her, um, has essentially moved me to a state of, of alternatives. But as I have that process, and I would say in the time that we've been apart, you know, I, this is, is something that I recognize, wow, this comes up a lot you know? yeah right and i and i think that even that realization is like wow okay if i was on the other end of this that would have felt very burdening to me too and so i'm able to see with a lot more compassion um you know for her than i than i think i was previously yeah that's really well said thanks for getting us started dan i appreciate yeah, it absolutely we'll talk with more with you another time yeah we'll go to jason next this uh this hunger that we feel the hunger for connection whether we learned it in you know childhood or we're wanting to be comforted and we don't have male friends or another place to go being hungry isn't bad but if we want to keep a sexual dynamic with our woman we can't go whining to mommy to feed us right absolutely yeah jason please come on in tell us about your spot right now um let's see so neat I, I so i actually had a bunch of uh, things happen lately that kind of uh kind of reversed some things for me um so it was my so the holidays were uh, as everybody asked me you know, how were your holidays and, you know they were strange um for the first time uh, my wife oh, well filed for divorce back in august you know wanted a divorce in june time frame um but i was you know this whole neediness yes i was extremely needy and but it took me a while to process this whole neediness of, I really wasn't understanding, you know, I knew I was needy, but I didn't know like how to resolve it. And I've been doing lots of things to self, try to self-regulate. I really got into meditation. Uh, sounds crazy, but you know, people don't 
quite believe it, but I try to meditate for at least an hour or two a day. So probably like at nights I've been, was doing about two hours of just pure silent meditation, which I don't know how it's like, usually it's like I look at the clock. I'm like, it's 10 o'clock. I'm like, holy shit. It's uh, you know, one, it's one o'clock in the morning now. It's like, where did the time go? Kind of thing where, um, but in the last couple of days it was my wife's birthday on uh, Thursday. And um, I actually was really needy. I uh, was trying to like make it a, a good birthday for you, like just like I would do for any good friend of mine. And I can I considered her a good friend, and she wanted to go skiing. And I tried to help her out with you know buying tickets and offered to go up there because, and to be honest, it was a little self. Uh, you know, I wanted to go skiing as well. So she changed her mind three, four times and said, finally said, no, I'm not going. I said, okay, fine, I'm going to go skiing. If you want to ride, I'm going to go up there. Um, she uh, went up there at the last minute and as a driving, she's like, you better not go up there or you're uninvited to my birthday dinner. I'm like, huh, whatever. I just text that. I just text her. I hope I don't see you up. This is really strange for me too. I was like, eh, okay, fine. I hope I don't see you up there. Um, then um, <laughs> have, a good, <laughs> have a good day um, up there. And, uh, and so I actually saw, I was, I was skiing. I saw her up at the top of the mountain having a beer. I was like, I'm going to have a beer. And cause you know, I've been drinking. So I was like, I'm gonna have a beer on an empty stomach and let it hit one beer and, <laughs> for the rest of the day. And, and listen to and, some and hard music time. and hang upside down and like, well, yeah. no, maybe and those, so, maybe those, those things don't go together. Drinking, drinking beer and hanging upside. So just for sake yeah. of the story, yeah, it doesn't really matter, but sake of the story. So she went up there, but she didn't want to go with you. Like you were, you wanted Correct. to go together, but she didn't want to go together. So she said, I don't want to see yeah. you up there. Is that the gist? Yeah. She said, she's like, I don't want to see you up there. I don't want you inter- uh, ruining my birthday. And I'm like, okay. Uh, I, I, <laughs> oh my God. That would make me want to go skiing really bad, Jason. I would really want to so, go skiing. Yeah. yeah. I was like, uh, so I saw her up at the top bar, just sitting and having a beer alone at a table. So I'm like, okay, I'm going to go down to the bottom of the hill and uh, go have a beer at the bottom of the hill bar. I ended up talking to guys at all the resort folks, uh, the maintenance. They invited me to go skiing with them. I had the best day nice. I've ever had skiing. Nice, and dude. so they took me on places that I've never been on the mountain that I've been to 30 times and was skiing things that I didn't really, I wasn't normally, I wouldn't take myself. I was skiing like double black diamonds and some crazy places that I normally would never have challenged myself to. So when I challenged and I, I was like, like, I've never, I haven't told her this yet, but I had the freaking her best birthday ever. So <laughs> um, <laughs> I love it, dude. Uh, so, yeah, you don't need to tell uh, her either. That's fine. No, and I she didn't ask me about anything or anything, but I told a buddy of mine, and uh, as we were just kind of chatting about, you know, what to do for her birthday today, because we're going to do as a family, and um, but you know, I the, yesterday that Thursday, I'm like, I talking about hearing the other people to kind of talk is like for me, there is this emptiness in my heart. Like I feel like there's this, this void. It was like a black hole, just kind of trying to suck in any kind of emotion that that needed it. But after that day, after Thursday, I just was like, I'm in doing meditation and like feeling it. I'm like, I don't feel that neediness anymore for the first time. It's just like, it's been, you know, uh, you know, seven months since it's been like that. And so that I totally know what this neediness is all about. But like this morning, she came in to pick up her parents because her parents were staying at my house uh, to be ne- near the kids. And uh, she came to go pick them up to the airport. And I was making some tea and, and she comes up to me and normally she just doesn't say anything. She just ignores me in the room like I'm a ghost. And she came up and she was like, good morning. I'm like, oh, hey, how's it going? And I, I, I said, for me, I'm just like, I don't, I, that loss of neediness was just amazing the past couple of days. I have just like, uh, and talking with other brothers and, the other brothers kind of helped me like put reframe my framework of that Thursday morning of like saying, you know, I hope I don't see you, but talking about that neediness is like, it was like, it was gone at that yeah, point. Yeah. That's, that's good stuff. Let me ask in a different way, what shifted in your mind? So you're up skiing, the story in your mind must have been different from one day to then the next day of I'm going to go skiing. I'm going to talk with these cool dudes here. I'm going to go, you know, double black diamonds, have fun. What was the difference in the story in your mind? that changed? I didn't have any expectations to be quite honest. I just was myself and I just, just kind of hung out and just, uh, I, the guy literally was talking to the guy in the bar and he was like, I just got laid off. I'm like, dude, I understand. I got laid off too. And I was just, I was just feeling like just having that empathy, just having a, like a vulnerable moment with another guy. And then it just led to this 
awesome day of had drinking beers. The guy was like, Hey, I got some beers in my lunch pail. I'm going to go grab them. We're going to go and let's go drink some beers in the gondola. And I'm like, okay, cool. Yeah. Nice. And, and, and it just, it was like having right. no expectations and just kind of letting the day flow rather than trying to, you know, control this or that. It was just like, yeah, whatever happens, let's just have fun. Yeah. Which is very kind of, cool. I, I felt like the, I felt like back into my own self and I was telling another brother today. It's like, today is like the, this first time I actually feel good. Like you guys always talk about, you're going to be okay. Like I was always like, yeah, I was on like, you know, forget that. And it wasn't actually forget that. It was more like more extreme. I was like, yeah, right. Am I ever going to feel okay again? And what is this okay feeling where, you know, I, all I want to do is, you know, get back and, you know, have my family back together. But now I'm like, just it, it, this whole part about needing this and, uh, letting go to me, um, what really resonated was uh, about acceptance. So another guy that was really uh, had been a sage in some of the groups has been, you know, letting go is, you know, yeah, they talk about it. And the letting go book was, you know, there's only like two pages. I found like they like really like, how do you let go? And the rest of the book talks about what the effects were, but untethering the untethered soul really kind of talks about the process. And it, to me, like he's summing it up as it's acceptance that's what kind of relieves that whole neediness So just accepting what is and letting it kind of unfold. And, um, you know, would I ever want to be back with my wife? I don't know at this point, because I feel as though she's got a lot of unhealthy habits that, you know, I would love for her to work on. Um, and so for me, that was the last trigger in my head right now that, you know, if it was to ever work out, then there's some things, conditions that I would want on it that, I mean, and I hate to say conditions, but it is because I would want her to be in a healthy place too. And talking about people are like, I went to a, a, a Thai restaurant that I've been going to and they're like, well, okay, they know that I was, I was getting divorced. I'm like, okay, let me hook you up with this lady and this lady and the, that the, <laughs> the, the, the owner is saying, and it's like uh, a very sweet and attractive lady. So I was like, uh, I was like, I don't know if I'm ready yet. And she, but, she, but at that point I'm like, you know, um, you know, I'm, I'd love to talk to people and, and stuff. But at that point is like this whole neediness letting go. Like I figured out that it was, I have this huge neediness and this anxious attachment that I just wanted someone to like, talk to me, like see me kind of thing. And I had never, I hadn't seen that in 10 years. So, um, and I don't know, I'll probably amaze guys here, but I haven't had, you know, sex and, you know, nine years so i mean having that desire is just it's like almost extreme like if i get any little sliver of it i'm like yes please kind of thing and then strike out i'm like oh, damn it okay and another day goes by where now i'm like whatever happens it's fine jason so so well said we you got to give guys the number to this thai restaurant dating service that you've got on the <laughs> hook you up but um yeah. So a couple of things you have your own practice, like Dan was saying, you have your own practice every day, so to speak of meditation, whether that be in guided meditation or transcendental meditation, which is with a mantra to keep that simple mm -hmm. or simply to go into nothingness, whatever that may be for you, but that's a masculine grounding practice that you have and being in acceptance, being an acceptance that someday we're going to die as the lyrics from this three days grace song, whether it's today or 50 years from now, and acceptance of the current moment of what's currently happening are, bo are both very masculine traits. It's this kind of sobering idea that we can have hunger and it's okay to not fill that with a woman. We feel that with ourselves, or we allow ourselves to feel that hunger, whatever it may be, or we go to other men or to friends or to the ski slopes or the gym or music to fill that hunger within our own selves. And that's what I'm hearing from you, Jason. Yeah. So where, where's the next edge for you? Would you, would you say what's next for you, Jason? Um, to be honest what I, I mean, I actually thought about this and it's like, I really don't want to get out there and like date or have it, but for me, I sit behind a computer like this all day long. And all I do is talk to guys cause I'm in technology to me. It's about really kind of putting myself out there and just being comfortable talking with women again. I don't need, I don't want the, you know, not going out there and get the hook up or anything, but it, for me, it really is this healing process to talk to women. And that's kind of where I see my next phase is that, uh, you know, just going out, putting myself, being vulnerable. I think that's, that's what it is. Learning to be vulnerable again. Nice. Yeah. I have a, do you want to hear my quick bit of homework for where you are yeah. that I give guys? Okay. 
So here's the homework. I want you to talk with two women a week for at least two minutes long. Now you can start with women that are behind the counter at a retail store or at the, you know, behind the the cash, the checkout person at a grocery store or something. And that's a good entry, but please be aware guys that if they're working, they're usually being nice to you because they're working. So don't get it twisted. Like the waitress was so nice to me. Yeah, she's working. <laughs> she's working. So you can use women while they're that are working to start you off. But over the next, let's say one year, I want you to talk with two women a week. And the goal is to simply have a conversation longer than two minutes. You're not trying to get a phone number. You're not trying to get anything. You're not trying to mastermind anything. All you're doing is practicing having a two minute conversation. It has to be a different woman, a woman you don't know. So 50 weeks times two, right, is going to be 100 women over the next year. And I won't tell you <laughs> because it, it kind of ruins the, the punchline down the road. Uh, you'd be amazed. I'm speaking to everybody here. You'd be amazed at how quickly men are having sex with or dating a woman with that homework. And it's not about trying to get anything. It's simply about having a conversation for two minutes, just like you're saying, Jason. So that's the, your mission. If you choose to accept it, Tom Cruise, to go speak with two women a week for at least two minutes. Yeah, I've heard, I've heard that before. And actually I go, I try to do that. I was doing that on the ski lifts and I was just striking up a conversation with whoever sat next to me. Um, uh, but when it was a female, so it was just, yeah, putting myself out there, being vulnerable. Good. Nice. Very cool. Nice, Jason. Thank good you. to talk with you. Yeah. Uh, George had his hand up and then put it back down. George, do you, can you still come in? Yeah, I, I yeah, can. I, I, I just, I, yeah, I just really, I, I think what Jason said underscores a, a really important point, which you've reiterated too. It's like you have a need uh, and you can even, I, I've recognized, I think my wife and I have both recognized for a long time because we've moved around a lot, it's very difficult at a certain point in your life um, to reconnect with other men, just other friends, right? And so that neediness is recognized intellectually as a need for friends. Unfortunately, if you're in a relationship with someone, that neediness is still for an intimate contact. It can't always be with your wife. And, you know, I'm at the point where, especially when you rec when we recognize in society that Women have somehow a better way that, that it's kind of more socially acceptable or it's more natural for women to get together, to talk, to share deep feelings. It's not as natural for men to do that, which is why the how to divorce the how to defuse the divorce bomb group has been good. Again, it's for me, it's still a virtual community. I still make my efforts to get out there, to do other things where I can come across. Still very frustrating to form the types of bonds and and um uh, connections that I want to, to take away the need to put any of that on my wife, which can then also from her standpoint, be seen as, okay, it's pressure on me. It's pressure on me just to have even a platonic intimate relationship, but there's a, probably a psychological thing for her saying, well, he's driving towards sex, right? <laughs> because that is ultimately, that is truly a need and a want, but yeah, you recognize very quickly that that's just pressure and take it off. I, I guess the only other thing I would say, I'm, I'm kind of right now where I'm at, I'm, I'm in marriage 2.0. In, in some ways, I think it would have been better uh, during the two and a half month separation that we had in house, if it had been a physical separation. But the neediness goes two ways. Like I recognize very quickly, my wife is needy for me too, because even during that separation period, I was pretty, you know, respecting her boundaries, letting her have her space. And it became quickly clear that she really needed somebody to talk to at the end of the day to to have that intimate connection just from a you know unburdening standpoint and i was there and then i think that kind of drove our getting back together very quickly since then um you know i've had bumps in the road but i i i recognize all these principles that are talked about i'm slowly getting them and really starting to put them to practice because i've seen the effect of you know I be it talking about the relationship or even if I'm baited, even if it's my wife that baits me into talking about the relationship when I go there, it can set things off. Uh, it creates that pressure. And, you know, even it, it, you, you get to a point where you then really have to recognize I'm at that point where I recognize so much of her own behaviors. They, they do come to a certain extent from resentments about we're being married for 27 years. We got married when I was 28. She was 21. 
She's never had the freedom to kind of be an adult on her own. So there is a certain amount of resentment that I've always sensed from her about not having that, that then I interpreted as, okay, I, I took it personally. I was hurt about it. But now I'm at the point where, I mean, she even kind of accused me the other day. Of, she, she said something, and it, again, it touches on the, her own pre-marriage relationship with her parents and her sister. And then she accused me, well, I, I'm setting a boundary. You can't ever criticize my parents again. And I I, I didn't even address it because I thought, I, I don't criticize your parents. I listen to you criticize them. Your dad, I listen to you criticize him. And I kind of have a conversation with you about it, but I don't do it. So all this to say, uh, that whole, that other principle of recognizing that it's her turmoil, right? It's not, It's to Dan's point, it's not necessarily, whatever she comes out at you is not about you. And I'm l slowly learning through these bumps that these principles that are spoken about, uh, work on yourself, uh, recognize it's her turmoil, it's not always about you, um, separate and just not care at all. I'm really starting to see the power of that because thankfully, even though I can screw things up sometimes, the minute I kind of go back and just separate out and work on myself, that draws her back in and everything is really nice and and comfortable again. It's it's amazing that it's amazing that the very little things that seem so benign that you don't think are going to push, they can push and they can wreck. I mean, and everyone's partner is different. Mine, thankfully, she's ultimately highly, highly sensitive. She's got her own turmoil and it's very easy for me to screw things up. But at the same time, there, there was even a point during the separation where I was convinced, I literally was convinced, I was working out and I said to myself, oh my God, she's going to come to me with divorce papers next week. But I was completely wrong in no time flat. She spun around the other way and things were fine. And, and the, the last thing I'll say is um, uh, the, um, yeah, that, that, that spin comes around. Oh yeah. I, I she, she, it, it just to underline the, the very little things, the sensitivities she had, she kind of got upset with me because, well, you know, the other day you were in a bad mood and, and I, Odd thing is, I told her my bad mood wasn't about her. I told her it was a frustration on my own part because the day before I'd worked out really intensely and I wanted to do a different workout that day, but I was just feeling so exhausted, frustrated with myself that I wouldn't be able to do it. And I told her that, but she took that bad mood that I had as very personal, that it was directed at her. And so, yeah, there's this there's, there's element of somehow having to walk on eggshells to a certain extent. But, you know, at the end of the day, I got to be comfortable in myself. She's going to have her own interpretation. She'll do what she does. And uh, there's a real freedom in just, you know, connecting with other people, being yourself, working on yourself, and and literally not caring uh, about it. And that, I don't mean to say it that way. You do care in a way, but you have to really detach completely. Um, the neediness is, is more than just direct neediness. It's about even your sometimes your own behaviors can be interpreted as neediness. It, it's just very, very strange. But uh, all this to say, I've, I've espoused a lot of the principles that I keep hearing from you from the how to defuse the divorce bomb. And I really do see that uh, I'm starting to get it. <laughs> basically. Yeah, good. So this is good stuff. George. Let me ask you a question about this, because I'm always interested to find your particular edge. Uh, so there's many concepts there, but let's just pick out a couple of them. You said when she even if she brings up the relationship, it still seems to go to conflict. I want to ask you about that in a moment. Mm -hmm. And then there's, you know, we all start off making mistakes when we don't even know we're making. Okay. And then we usually learn to shut the hell up a lot more. <laughs> like, like don't try to drive to a logical or intellectual resolution because that's that usually that just shooting ourselves in the dick doing that. Right. So we usually shut up a hell of a lot more. And then it's all right. How do we bring in the advanced skills of being a lover? not just being quiet and she misinterprets his things maybe, but then how do we, so where's your edge in particular with what you were speaking of there, either talking about the relationship when she brings it up and it doesn't seem to go well, or maybe with your own skill practice seem to be so two areas. When you say my think. edge, my, my downfall or, or yeah. What? what do you think is your edge is exactly right? Like you don't know what to do next or things go off the rails when something happens. Yeah. Well, so I made the big mistake a couple of days ago where you know, she had, this was during a period in, uh, just as a background, during a period in counseling, uh, she had brought up a 90-minute walk that we had 
pre during Thanksgiving and during this light show. And she came, it was a very enjoyable evening. In fact, that, that that evening, very evening, she had sexual relations with me. She was obviously very open. But then we went to marriage counseling when she caught back from Thanksgiving break. She went to go visit her parents on her own. She comes back and she tells the counselor, well, you know, George went on a, 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 a three quarters of the time that we were walking together. He was talking about work and work. I was like, I guarantee you it wasn't three quarters of the 90 minutes. It was 10 minutes at most. And it was just an engagement. I was just completely blown. So with that background in mind, I have I went the other extreme. I, I said, I'm not going to talk about work because she clearly misinterprets how much is talked about. Maybe that's how she feels. Okay, I'll respect that. But you're in a catch-22 because if you don't say anything, she'll feel your stuff. So long and short. Well, that's, yeah, that's trying to address the symptom, right? So what do you think is really underneath that? Well, yeah. I, I, it, it, it's her own insecure. I don't know. I'm still in the process yeah. of feeling that one out. So two days ago, I made the mistake because, you know, I listened. She asked me something. I can't even remember what the topic was. And then she got on to work and I gave a couple of details. And then I let her speak about her day, blah, blah, blah. I, I wasn't too internally. I wasn't too thrilled with something that, you know, something that I was very positive about at work that she said she wanted to hear. And she really didn't her whole body language is just like blowing it off. And yeah, I, I kind of took that personally. I kept it inside. I don't think my body language is bad. So I went and asked her about her day. She went and spoke. Then she said to me, she said, so any, any specific emotions at work? And I thought to myself, that's what's gotten to me in trouble in the first place. That, that emotional stuff is in fact, uh, one part of the recipe that led to our separation. So I very calmly said, I, I made the mistake of calmly saying, uh, I don't know that I should bring up any emotional concepts, uh, things that happened at work. That's gotten me into trouble in the past. I said that very calmly, very, oh my God, did that set, that set things on this thing. And no matter, you know, if you're in, in the process of engaging and you're trying to be calm about it, even if you're calm and again, to your point, you can't go into the rational or logical and, and even if you're calm about it. Sure. So let me, let me jump in. Let me jump in. So what do you think that she was really upset about? in the way and what you said, what do you think? Because it was, well, what she addressed is, oh, it doesn't help to bring up the past. So my, my saying that the, the emotional stuff has gotten me into trouble in the past is taken as a criticism of her because she in fact has criticized me in the past for this. So you can't win. I, I think that's it. It's for her, at least from what she said is you're bringing up or you're referencing anything from the past. And it's not that long ago does not build an intimate space for us to move forward. And yet the reality is the standard of ex- the standard of behavior she expects from me is one that she doesn't hold herself. And she's oh, demonstrated- she, it's a, I mean, that's always a catch 22. Like we're I not, know, exact, but, you know, I, I don't, standard, I don't I focus say, on a double, a double standard, I should say, yeah. but the, yeah. the catch 22 part is she wants you to share her emotions, but doesn't want you to share her emotions, whatever, whatever the term yeah, is, whatever. But so George with, it sounds like, and you tell me, Sounds like she doesn't feel you're meeting her emotionally, whether that's true or not. But that's what it sounds like she feels. It varies. I mean, yeah, obviously there there are clear days now in this marriage 2.0 phase. She has herself said, you know, she's seen lots of, you know, she's confident in moving forward with us and long term relationship together because she's seen how I have respected her or, you know, her, uh, gotten in touch with her emotionally. You know, it's still a work in progress. I, I'm not perfect. Right. But yeah, to, I don't, the, the source of saying, um, I mean, my comment about getting into trouble and referencing the past, uh, is that not, is, is doing that not meeting her emotional need? I, I don't know. I mean, on the surface, what she's saying is any reference to the past or our past difficulty doesn't allow us to move forward. Well, so, so yeah, I, I, I like to keep things as simple as possible. And I think about the instinctual drives that she has. And you and I have talked, I think, well, at least one other well, time, so. not not extensively, and I don't know your wife. Um, so she feels she shame. Does, she does so, what oh, you do. Hold on, let me, yeah. hold on, let me, let me finish. So she she feels she feels shame when you bring up the past because of other criticisms. Let's just put a period on that. Doesn't right. mean it's right, right or wrong or otherwise. The story that you told, she wants to feel emotion from you. But she also has reactions to your to your emotions, which then seem to upset both of you. Uh, that's, that's they upset. They have in the past upset her, and I've had to modulate, really respect her own past 
trauma and, and modulate myself for that reason. And I've trained myself to do that you know, to, to meet okay. her expectation, which sure, sure. And the modulate yourself. So this is a, the modulate yourself is a whole conversation that I want to, I'll plant a seed and you and I can talk another time, George, or we can have another, you know, call guys, a group call on this. Cause I don't want to get too off. Um, the modulate myself, the catch with all of that is we can't fear whatever emotions that she's having. Right. And we can't try to avoid something out of fear fear of upsetting her yeah. fear of saying the wrong thing. And so she smells blood in the water. If we have fear of her emotions, it's like blood in the water and that yeah. pisses her off. So yeah. we're talking about a multiple things, of course, but I want, again, I wanted to find your edge, not only for you, but for every man that's watching this and for honestly, my interest is like how are, how things are going well. And then, all right, where's the difficult spot for you? Would you add anything else onto that, George? No, I mean, I, I I think ultimately you, that the, you hit the nail on the head. Like that's why I said I finished all of this, all of my convoluted statements and piecemeal finished off by saying I'm getting to the point where I just I can't care anymore about what how she's going to interpret it or how it's how her interpretation of me is going to make me feel. I have to because that not caring in one sense is getting back to who I am and being very natural about it. I can respect her feelings to a certain extent, but I got to be me and. Yeah, there's a certain amount of modulation, not out of fear, but because it's good for me not to, you know, to train myself to do that with other people, for example, if they're interpreting me a particular way. Uh, I can, I can, I can modulate. I'm talking about modulating my emotional overdrive that can make send her in a place of fear. I'm not gotcha, going to modulate yeah. the content, content of what I say. And, and in some sense, I haven't completely, mo I'm not, I'm getting back to a little bit closer to the way I used to be because I think she's more comfortable but the the downfall i think ultimately in all of this can be if i if i brought up that point about well i don't want to talk about the emotional thing about work because that got me up into trouble before yeah that's that's speaking to a fear of not being open and so i should have just told her and been free about it you know and and not and not and not watched myself and told her i'm watching myself that's what you know yeah um, yeah, yeah. Everything you're saying, I agree with. Let me let me put one other thing on the table and then we'll bounce over to Dan and Art and there's guys in the chat too. You know, as you were just talking there, George, to me, it feels like the way this feels when standing in front of a woman, if I've done my practice, so Jason does meditation, Dan lays up, hangs upside down, <laughs> we go to the gym, you know, we do our morning stuff, we get our stuff ready. I feel a lot of energy in my body. It's a good thing. You know, I don't feel dead. Feeling dead is the, I learned to shut up and just shut my mouth. And oh my God, I can't have any emotions at all. And I just numb myself. That's not really where we're all trying to go, guys, right? We want to feel inspired. So I feel like Iron Man with this kind of glowing, you know, power in my chest or love in my heart, you could say, or breathing love to the world or however the words you want to use. That's So this power in my chest, but my face, the facial reactions are much, much less reactive than I was in the past. Like my face doesn't immediately represent how I feel any longer. My practice is this is calmness. I'm not surprised by her accusations or upset or, um, you know, being annoyed that I talked for 45 minutes on a walk, which didn't really happen. So my face is more calm, but my heart and my chest have a lot of love for her, have a lot of energy for myself, for my work, for my life. That's where I want, that's where I have taken this. And that's where I think you're that's your next step is yeah. still keeping to feel really alive and be relaxed here, regardless of her emotions. Yeah. You're nodding. Yeah. That's yeah. Good. Yeah. Good stuff. Thanks, George. Appreciate it, man. Good to see you. Yeah. Dan, come on in, please. Thanks for being patient. I'm going to go to art. Yeah. No worries. Okay. So just wanted to see, um, wanted to get some coaching. So what attracted me on coming on this call was, I would say primarily what hit home was helped her trust you more easy mindset hack. So maybe you could share a little bit, but before you do that, I'll share you a little story that happened this morning. So I've been married 35 years. We're still together, but long story short, about a year ago, as you know, uh, I was gaslighting. So I was labeled a gaslighter. So work through that pretty much aware when I am gaslighting and I catch it or I'll say hey, that was, or she'll bring it up. Anyway, so yesterday at lunchtime, 
we had went to BP the day before. She had some leftover. The kids ate my leftover, so she had some leftover. She wasn't available, so I grabbed half of her leftovers. Saying, oh, she probably would be okay with this, you know. So, but she wasn't available to ask if she okay if I grabbed half of her leftovers. So I ate half of her leftover, and then um, that didn't sit well when I told her because she twisted it around that I manipulated her or something, and. So that was the start of it. So then, okay, I felt guilty. I, you know what? I should have respected her food and, you know, not eat her food. So last night when I was coming home from hockey, I said, I called her and said, you know what? I feel, you know, what do you want? I'm going to bring you some food tonight. What are you doing? Oh, I'm not hungry. That's fine. Blah, blah, blah. So I came home and I had some leftover myself. I had grabbed some stuff. So I said, hey, I, I have some butter chicken, whatever, and some onion cake and I totally forgot that I had a uh, wonton soup. I didn't mention that one. So, and then she's, no, that's not good for me. Yeah, I know, but sorry about that. But, and then later she was going to bed or about to go to bed. Was, oh, you know what? I still have one. I forgot to tell you, I have wonton soup. So that was the trigger this morning. She says, you know, I can't trust you. You, you, you purposely accused me of purposely leaving out the, wonton soup which for me is the is the least favorite of the butter chicken but she made you know saying that i can't trust the you you left purposely left that bad didn't tell you that i had the wonton and then i go what so it's kind of you know try like you said trying to be calm and just inside i was going what the hell is happening and now i said i think i said is the the gaslighting i think she's still feels that I'm gaslighting somewhat because it's been a number of years. We've been married 35 years. So I guess I'm looking for coaching. I feel like I'm in ground negative 10 here going out of this trust part. So I have a, so many feels like it's going to take so many years to gain that trust back. I'm going to open it up for you. So, okay. Okay. Good. <laughs> uh, going to gain you going to take years to take, to get wonton soup. Trust that. No, I'm just joking. Um, okay. So you and I have worked together and without going off too much, not taking too much time, there's a couple of main concepts. All right. So gentlemen, we hear all the time and I'll, I'll come back to your spot here in a second, Dan. We hear all the time, guys, right? Validate her emotions. Validate her emotions. Okay. Now, 15 years of my professional training around behavioral psychology is yes, we want to, as a baseline, validate her emotions. However, if that other person, if she is utilizing this to gain something in an unhealthy way, if she's getting energy from us in an unhealthy way, if she's beating us up, if she's playing a power dynamic, like you're always gaslighting me, you narcissistic pig, I can't trust you because you purposefully didn't tell me about the wonton soup and therefore you're a manipulative patriarchal bastard or whatever words come out of her mouth okay i'm not interested in validating unhealthy behavior okay even when it's a 12 year old child who's been adopted five different times and gone through hell okay which i dealt with those kind of kids every single day in the school system for instance I would validate their existence. I would validate them as a person, but I would not validate their negative attempts. They're unhealthy, I should say. They're unhealthy attempts to get attention and to what I call bookend you, bookend you into a story. So she's putting you in a bookend, as I call it. You know, I can't trust you because you you're a liar. You're you're a gaslighter and you're a liar. And so we can understand that we could go i could go on and on and on this but what we do is we throw away her book end we we cannot abide by her book end because it will never stop someone who's trying to gain something in an unhealthy way by the way it's a maladaptive behavior from childhood usually we don't need to go into all that of why i most people are not maliciously evil i don't ex i don't expect anyone's wife here necessarily to be doing this kind of thing maliciously but she's still doing it and guess what if you play into that frame you're a lying gaslighting you know asshole mm -hmm. and then now what you're trying to dig yourself out of this 100 foot hole for the so mm -hmm. 
so the, the, the basis of your question, which is what's the mindset hack is perfect for this. And I call it the theater in your mind, this, which is another way to say the story that you're telling yourself about the situation and the character you're playing within that story, the theater in your mind. So if you're accepting her framing, then you're in her play as the gaslighting, lying, untrustable asshole. And I'm not interested in that story. I'm not interested in playing into that frame. So what would what would you want the story in your mind, the theater in your mind to be when your woman comes to you and says, you purposefully didn't tell me about the wonton soup and I can't trust you ever again. And what she's not saying is, I feel betrayed from the past and I'm projecting this on you. And if you supplicate yourself to me, I'll feel better for a little while and I'll feel more powerful within my own self. Like she doesn't, she's probably not aware of all that or she, or I hope that she, <laughs> anyway, so back, yeah. back to you, Dan, it's, uh, now what exactly you say depends on the situation and is tough, you know, and I'm not going to try to play it out here exactly, but in my mind, it's, I'm not going to play the I purpose, I'm not going to try to appease or, or dissuade her from thinking that I purposefully didn't talk about the wonton soup. Cause you're just, you can't win. You're in her frame. Yeah. Well, let me tell you why I didn't purposefully, <laughs> you know, that's just bullshit. You just don't play in that yeah. game. So I would just go to the emotion. So in, in my mind, I'm thinking she's a wound, she's wounded. She doesn't, she feels insecure. Mm. I, I'm, I'm in front of her. So I'm the punching bag instead of going to the gym or something. She's you taking it out on me. It's her way to express. So I feel bad for her. Like I feel bad for the pain that's inside of her. Mm -hmm. So I would go right to the emotion. Like, it seems like you feel betrayed right now. It seems like you feel alone right now. And I would go from there. So take, how does that all come across yeah. to you? Yeah. So that's a very good one. <sighs> Yeah, and then I kind of gently said it was uncommon, you know, honestly, it was an unconscious. That just sounds like defending, right? So I kind of defended by saying, no, it was not purposeful. It was, I just unconsciously forgot to tell you. And then I remembered before you're going to bed now. So coming back to what you said about the bookend, don't, yeah, so don't play into the bookend. How do you say that again? Uh, to explain That's, a little bit more there. Yeah. Yeah. So the, your question is what's the mindset hack? And the answer yeah. is I call the theater in your mind and the theater in your mind is what's the role I'm playing mm -hmm. in the dynamic that's happening right now. Am I giving myself the role or am I just allowing her to put me in the role as villain? Okay. okay. So I like, okay. So I liked what you said um uncover the emotion that she's feeling provide empathy and what comes up for me after that is she clearly has years of not trusting not being saved around me so is that something that I consciously should be looking for as far, you know, little tidbits of stuff that I could be doing consciously to make her feel trustworthy or to make her feel that she can trust me or no safety. No. So don't even do that. <laughs> okay. So, so the, the short answer is no, because it's trying to appease into mm. her unhealthy dynamic. Okay. The longer answer is, just you as a man in relationship with this woman or any woman, you do things that would be pop, right? You do good mm -hmm. things for the relationship. Mm -hmm. You do things that show that you're trustworthy, not to try to prove to her mm -hmm. against this bookend that she's putting out there. So in other words, we can't try to appease her. It doesn't work. Mm. just like it sounds like you tried to get more food the next day to kind of smooth things over mm -hmm. does that yeah. shit doesn't work guys don't buy her <laughs> flowers when she's angry like don't do that it, yeah. it's it's blood in the water and to be honest it makes it harder it's like um let's so you made a mistake you just own the mistake right you tripped and fell and smashed your face mm -hmm. and she saw that okay you know and she's like be more careful or whatever 
Like, yeah. you're right, sweetie. You're right. And then it's like the next day going back to her and bringing it up again when you mm. buy flowers or buy more food mm. or try to appease her. It just feels manipulative and like a like it's total f- bullshit to a woman. Mm. It's like, stop trying to fucking smooth things over. Right. So, yeah. Well, the comment she said was, it was not the food or it was she felt disrespected. Sure. So I'd say, yeah, you're right. I, I could totally see why you felt disrespected when I ate your leftovers. You're totally right. I'm sorry. Yeah. And then just drop and move on. Yeah, that's it. No. Okay. Yeah. And then the last thing is uh, the other thing I been re uh, reading the masculine relationship. Yeah. One by uh, young blood. blood. Yeah. So the biggest thing that came out last night was wanting. So the wanting, I I don't know what I want. More importantly, I don't express what I want. In uh, you know, so and it's totally classic nice guy syndrome, right? Like I look at that as oh, wow, that's crazy. So, uh, but then you know, he also said to be to have a freedom of wanting, and that's and and relish on the the beauty of the want, like not tied to the result, but just say, yeah, that's what I want. And if, if it doesn't come, you know, to fruition, it doesn't come to a big deal. Right. But you, you actually express your want and that you live in. So you're constantly looking what I want. So that's my new beginning today was, okay, what do I want? You know? And that's, uh, yeah. So that yeah, was what, like, powerful. like, what do you, what do you want to eat for, uh, the next meal today for lunch today? What do you want to eat? It's a trick question. <laughs> no, it's. No. I mean, I'm inferring something, but it's not a trick question. <laughs> okay. What What do you want to eat for lunch today? Oh, well, my leftover, <laughs> leftover <laughs> butter chicken. wonton soup, baby, <laughs> butter chicken. Uh, that's what I'm gonna eat. So, okay, uh, so what, you want yeah. to eat that, right? Sure. Yeah. Okay, so you have a want that's directed in a certain way, and if the wonton soup's not there, the world doesn't end. You figure it out. Right. right. Yeah. Or like I love I've I kind of use this as a oh, metaphor. Okay. I love pumpkin pie. Right. I love yeah. pumpkin pie. Guy. Every time I walk by the bakery section in the in the grocery store, I literally say, oh, hello, pumpkin pie. <laughs> he- hello. I'll see you another time. And you fucking believe me over the past, you know, six weeks of the holidays, I've eaten <laughs> my fair share of pumpkin pie. Now, if I don't get pumpkin pie, I don't cry in my milk over it. But right. I declare that I want pumpkin pie. I declare that I want sex. I declare that I want to fuck her brains out. Yeah. Doesn't mean it's going to happen necessarily today. Yeah. Okay. But yeah, it's going to happen sometime. Mm-hmm. So what's something that you think you should want? Like there's a should behind what you're saying. So what's something you think you should want? Or does she, does she tell you you should want something in particular? Or where, what's the next thing for you that you want? Well, yeah, sex is always on the table and she knows that. So I pretty much gave her... Okay, whenever I said that was, I just realized that's a bad move. But so I said, okay, so whenever you want that, let me know. (laughs) (laughs) That's never going to happen, right? So so I'm going, okay, I need to take that one back. So that's the the, the GS Youngblood there. If you talk about sexual desires, and I'm, oh, yeah. Sure. So let me, let me jump in and we'll keep it simple for now. You don't need to take it (laughs) back. I mean, it's just, it's kind of like yelling into the void to say, come to me. That's a whole other topic, too. I've talked about before. But um, so, Dan, let's say um, if you told your wife, and it has to be true, okay, if you said later on tonight, I want to, I want to kiss you passionately and if it doesn't happen i'm picking something kind of small okay. but you yeah. have to want it or or later tonight i want to take a bath with you you might say to her you know mm. something that's in, that you only do with your woman that's intimate but it's, yeah. it's easier than sex meaning you're not going to be yeah. upset if you don't get it so later on tonight i want to take a bath with you and kiss, kiss you passionately mm-hmm. as an example and if it doesn't happen, not a big deal. Maybe the bath happens tomorrow or three weeks from now or whatever it may be, but it's something you're saying that you want. And the the key is, like I was saying earlier, you have fire in your chest about it, but you're pretty mm-hmm. relaxed in your face wow. and you're not looking for her to give you any kind of answer. Like you, you could actually be just talking to her picture, which is homework that I do give guys is mm-hmm. to say things to her picture. So you practice looking at her eyes 
and mm. literally not expecting any response because it's their fucking picture. Mm. Say like, I want to kiss you passionately. And if you can't even do that to her picture, guys, <laughs> like we got to work on it. So <laughs> something small like that, do it to yeah. her picture first. If you want to practice, do it to her. Um, and notice we kind of get this, our stomach turns over like, oh my God, she's going to be mad or she's going to think I'm pressuring her or something like that. Mm -hmm. You, you got to pick something to start. Mm -hmm. And if she's upset by it, that's another bridge to cross. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Good. Good stuff, Dan. Perfect. Great. Yeah, man. Thanks, Jeff. Good to see you. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Art, thanks for being patient. Come on in. Hey, how's it going, everybody? Um, God, where do I even start? Um, see, the bomb got dropped on me back in August, and I immediately did the drop to my knees, beg the whole nine yards. You know, uh, I'm uh, we've been together 13 years, married for 10. Uh, I got two, two uh, twin girls. And um, that first 90 days was nothing but self-flagellation. The energy that was right. coming off me was just reeking of just desperation. You know, I was the yeah. classic panic, you know, didn't know what to do. And and uh, I had I had uh, really started to really look for try a way to pick up the pieces. Wife was pretty adamant about. Uh, I don't see a future with you. I don't respect you. Uh, you know, and there you was have a no small dick. I've never yeah, loved you. You don't that. buy me wonton soup. Come on. Yeah, it was just all that. And and the thing is, it's our our marriage was really suffering from the death of a thousand cuts over time. There sure. was no one thing that was you know. There's no uh, nobody cheated on anybody. No drugs. Nothing like that. It was just finally there was one triggering point, which was uh, I had hit a, a bit of a a nicotine habit, you know, via vape. And she had found a vape that dropped in my daughter's uh, bunk. And uh, that was it. That was the, that was the, that was the catalyst for it all. Uh, but I wouldn't say that it was any sort of massive, oh, this is the event that, you know, right. it's just death by a thousand cuts. And, and since that time, she wanted to go into couples therapy. And I right away was like, no problem. Let's go to couples therapy. Let's fix this thing, you know? And turns out we got into couples therapy and it was a place for her to put together a strategy to uncouple, get separated and eventually divorce. And uh, so I found myself fighting two fronts, one being the therapist and her, which was now validating her need to get out of this relationship. And then myself trying to pick up the pieces for myself. So I immediately went into, all right, we're going to go into survival mode here. You do you, and I went in, into men's groups, found found uh, how to fuse the divorce bomb and all that, and really started doing some internal work. Since that time, I have been able to switch my mindset, have gone into self-care, gone into hot yoga, really, yeah. really into the philosophies of, you know what, what comes, comes, you yeah. know, and, and yeah. really elevating myself, looking through my phone, seeing trying to figure out man how many friends do i have and it shocked me i didn't really have that many friends it's like holy shit you know all this time what i had been given up by going into my family just poured myself into my family grinding coming home anyways you guys i'm sure you've heard all these kind of stories so i currently am at a place where what i'm while i'm rebuilding myself uh, into 2.0, I would love to keep my family together, but not to go back to what it was, but to elevate into something else, whatever that's going to be. And if that includes an actual physical separation that may also eventually go into divorce, I'm, I'm trying to get out of the neediness of not being afraid of that, you know, and, and yeah. also, and, and, and also, the energies and the kind of what everybody's been saying, like the micro expressions, all this stuff, you know, like I still find myself kind of white knuckling. Yeah. A bit, you sure. know, but maybe it's still early on in the process of all that, but that's practically where I'm at right now. Now we're separated in the home, but we have a really good relationship. We've, the holidays were great. We shared uh time with friends and family, um, have shared 
light moments, a lot of light moments together, a lot of laughter, little jokes. You know, we still text each other, little bullshit, you know, that happens through life. So there's a basis of 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 uh, potential friendship that can go into something. And I'm just trying to keep myself in check as far as like, hey, dude, you know, don't take these things as, you know, like like little bits of chum that she's throwing out in the water, you know, and I'm just coming up for it. You know what I mean? I'm trying to right. really keep it like, you know, keep it together, brother. You know what I mean? Keep it together. Rebuild little at a time. Yeah. So that's where I'm at, man. Yeah. Thanks for being here, dude. I appreciate it. Uh, thinking of a question, like what question you might have, you said white knuckle gripping. Do you have a particular question where you are, Art? Yeah. How do I... How do I let go? How do I detach? Sure. I'll ask a dumb question. Let let go of what? Detach what from what? I think my, what we all call the, the outcome of, of, you know, reconciliation. I, I think that that's the big one for me. How do I let go of that wanting and that need to, to reconcile? Yeah. Okay. That's a great question. Uh, <laughs> the answer to this is kind of a bazooka. Uh, are you okay if I just fire a bazooka off here? Is that okay? Yeah, it's okay. <laughs> it's like shit. Hey, man. You know, yeah, yeah. So, so here's the answer. Than, can't be any worse than the bomb that was dropped. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. And you're not fucking me, so it's sort of, yeah. <laughs> so, okay. <laughs> so okay, there's there's two sides to my answer. One side is, of course, you want reconciliation. Of course. You want this woman who you love, who you've loved for so long, who's the mother of your children, who will always have a place in your heart, who you have envisioned for the rest of your life, growing old, sitting next to her on a rocking chair. I had those visions and two, right? Like, I think every man that's in this work that's attracted to me and Steve Forsman and Dan and good guys to great men and my, like, we're kind of romantics at heart. We want relationship. We're not here to just spin plates, fuck a bunch of women. Of course you want reconciliation with her. Of course. Okay. On the other side of things, she never was yours. Marriage is never a promise that you're actually going to stay together forever. No matter what words are said, no matter the intention nowadays, that's not a promise. So uh, let's say this is the bazooka part. So let's say all the Disney movies and culture and all that kind of lied to you, meaning we thought we could relax after we got married. That's just like the idea. At least I could go on and on. We, we thought we could relax, but you can't. It's still the same as before being married, but it feels like a finish line. As a man, we shoot to accomplish a goal. And when we accomplish a goal, it's, it feels like a relax, a release into freedom. Okay, I don't need to worry about that anymore. I don't need to address that anymore because I've accomplished it. But that's absolutely not what marriage is. And so we end up doing all these bad habits and taking her for granted and becoming needy like she's our mommy because of all of those things. Okay. So when a woman says, I love you, but I'm not in love with you, here's more bazooka guys. When a woman says, I love you, but I'm not in love with you, or she's going to counseling to affirm her already belief that the relationship is over. Okay. The relationship is over. The version 1.0 of the relationship is dead. It has a stake in its heart and it's a zombie walking around right now. And she's throwing you chum to use your words because she wants a cordial relationship or because she doesn't want to you know, be thrown out in the street. Not that that would happen, but she doesn't want everyone around her to think that she's the bad guy, bitch, that caused the destruction of your relation. Like all these reasons, she never was yours. And she never was for sure yours. And this marriage never was a finish line where we can just take our hands off the wheel and put it on autopilot. And I made all those mistakes too. Okay. So I, if we were doing one-on-one -on -one coaching, I would give you more specific homework on visualizing a future, not purposefully without her, but for you and for a relationship that you want to have with a woman who may not be her to keep this joy and love and values and passion alive that every man here, including me wants in relationship, but it's not just her. Like in the past, the vision of those things, happiness, future, 
love, sex, connection was a picture of her face. But that was never true. That was never the be all end all of what our sexuality or our ability to love or our, our sense of value came from was her happy face. That never was true. So, so much of this work art is a, is a reshuffling of our values back to it's got to begin with us. And she's just icing on the cake. Like we hear now the white knuckle part is yeah. Our fucking knees got kicked out through all of this work. And this bazooka that I'm firing here sounds really bad. The other side, so it's mistakes we didn't know we were making. Usually we learn to kind of shut the hell up and numb ourselves, or, you know, stop having expectations, which just feels like we're dead, kind of, is the middle interim, to we feel inspired within our own self, within our own heart, within our own life. And if she's upset, we care about her as a person, but we're not trying to appease her. She's welcome to her feelings. She's welcome to her sense of, you know, life. And we're going to keep driving forward to those things that fuel our heart and fuel our soul. And if she's interested in those things and our newfound sense of confidence and lack of neediness, then she'll most likely be interested in us again in the future because she did love you in the past, because you do have children together, because it wasn't fake. When you, you know, when you got married, the two of you loved each other. She loved you. She has loved you. She still has love for her heart in her heart for you. She's just very turned off and disgusted right now is usually the case. So how do we not turn her off so much? How do we not disgust her so much? And how do we build our own passion and joy and life and let go of the white knuckle? Because, you know, we learn over time as you and all guys learn, including myself, Art, that the white knuckle only makes them run harder, makes them pull harder, pull away harder. Yeah. So what there, I mean, that wasn't too bad of a bazooka, I guess, but what there may be relatively new to you, what, what, are you trying to ingrain in your psyche and in your philosophy and in your mind of what I said there? You know, a re real simple and like a lot of a lot of gentlemen have been speaking. What I'm getting a lot is uh, I'm still at a place where I'm emptying my cup. I'm emptying all that shit out, you know, slowly but surely, so that I can start filling it up with all this good stuff, you know. And uh, like you know, I mean, it's 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 hardcore. But you got to like burn it to the ground almost to rebuild it, you know, and that's kind of. Yeah, within ourself, right? Within ourselves, exactly. That's right. Yeah, that's exactly yeah. right. There's a process I call walking through hell, which put simply is what's the mo what's the biggest fear I can possibly imagine? And like mine for me would be something terrible happens with my son and my son dies or something like something fucking horrific like that. Right. Like that's, and it's hard for me to even say now, and I've done this practice a lot and I've said this out loud quite a few times because I, that's the, my worst fear, let's say. Okay. Or, you know, something horrific, right? the, the most horrific thing you can imagine. And the meditation is for two minutes, actually believe that that's happening or happened, like feel it in your body that that, 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 that that's happened. And then what would you do thereafter? Okay. So the part of it is you earn, you're in resistance to it. And I usually do this while I'm on the treadmill or something guys, you know, where I'm like 20 minutes in and it, it's already kind of flowing, you know? So for the, for those two minutes, it's horrible, terrifying. Maybe you cry. Maybe it's like, you want to rip your skin off. You know, it's like terrible. And then, all right, if that did happen, what would I do thereafter? There'd be a period of grieving. You know, I'd want to jump off a cliff. I'd probably stay in bed for however many, whatever. You know, and then after that, what would I do? Would I dedicate myself to some cause in the world so that to help other families so that something like what happened with my son wouldn't happen, hopefully, to other families? You know, would I give myself to a cause in the world kind of a thing? So yeah, jumping off a bridge would still be on the menu, but what, not, you know, joking, but not joking. And then what would I do thereafter if I didn't end my own life? How, how could I value, how could I bring value to the world still? And you know, that's it, a masculine, yeah, go ahead, Art, please. Oh, sorry, uh, not to cut you off. I mean, the, you know, throughout this whole process, I've, I've also been, once I got, a, once I started being able to get out of my own way, I really started leaning into my kids you know, like really leaned into the idea of kind of very similar to what you said. I started thinking of, God forbid anything happened to her, I still have to be here for the kids, you know? And so for me to have to level up and get out of my own emotional shit 
so that I could be stable enough to raise these kids is something that's actually buoyed me. Not that it's right for everybody. In my particular situation, it's helped help buoy me a bit, you know, as far as like yeah. not being able to think of her. Like, God, like if you're not here, what am I gonna do? You know what I mean? Like, like so yeah. good. So it's very, very very similar to what you're kind of saying, you know. So I, I appreciate that feedback. Um yeah, you're on you're absolutely are. Yeah, you're on the path, bro, and there's stages to this, right? Um the bazooka really is like the how do I want to say this? There's the human animal part of us, our instinctual drives, right? Our instinctual brain, our instinctual desires, and then there's the human spirit part of us. And the human spirit is the part of us that gets married. Like happily ever after, romantic, okay? But there's still the human animal inside of us. And right now, most men come to this work when the human animal part of her is turned off and disgusted. So we have to acknowledge the behavioral psychology, the evolutionary psychology, which is let go of the white knuckle grip because that's only gonna push her away. And all the rest of what we're talking about now is the how. The how do we do that? The theater in your mind, the what you do for yourself, whether it's hanging upside down and working out or skiing or, you know, stealing her soup or whatever it may be. Kind of, <laughs> it's kind of or forgetting to tell everybody else. Like all of that is the how, right? And and you're on the path, right? You're in the right place, man. Great questions. Absolutely. All right. So guys at this point sometimes want to know how to reach out and get more information. I'm going to look at the chat here. So good guys to great men coaches. The first line there is for all of the good guys to great men coaches with Steve and Dan and myself and Tim and all the other coaches. Great men move mountains is my website, greatmenmovemountains.com. Uh, my partner and I, who's my wife now, Cynthia Cruz, she and I work together. We do calls together as well. Sometimes we do group calls together and we both recorded a free 45 minute audio book. And if you haven't got that yet, greatmenmovemountains.com slash free audio book. And if you want to reach out to me directly, Jeff at greatmenmovemountains.com, right? And we've got my free private Facebook group there as well. If you want to join us there. Yeah, please, bud. Yeah, go for it. Just, I mean, to be, I guess a little quick about it. I get a lot of what people have said. I've heard echoed in my own situation. I guess I'm kind of, uh, newer in the situation and that this is something that I've been um, dealing with knowing about for, I don't know, six weeks or so, you know, I uh, haven't had a conversation about a, a lot of what you said, like, you know, uh, I, I'm, I'm not attracted to you at the moment. You know, I, uh, I don't know if I can be again in the future, things of that nature ha had been said. Right. Um, but in my situation, it's a little bit different. Nobody had spoken uh, about this before and, you know, I haven't, spoken about it a lot either but i guess it's something to bring up and maybe seek some advice on is that uh my situation was caused i mean everyone says like you know no one person is all in the wrong right but in my situation i mean maybe i was because right? the situation oh, does this have was to do with wonton by... soup we already heard that's bad no no i think okay. it's not right. wonton soup it's Woo! not a bait pen uh in, in this case it was a little bit different in that uh yeah. my situation was caused by my own poor judgment and 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 getting involved in the substance abuse issue you know um I, I, you know, had an issue that um, got a little worse during COVID, you know, definitely being locked in the house wasn't helping with nothing to do. Yeah. Um, I guess, I, you know, messed around a little bit too much in my youth, maybe I had a little bit too much fun, you might say, and that kind of caught up with me a little later on. Um, everything, I mean, I'm sorted, handled, I've been, you know, without that issue for over a year and a half now. Uh, so here I am thinking, you know, a year and a half hey, later. Congrats, everything. man. Yeah. Great, well, I'll, right? I'll say then, congratulations, dude. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I mean, thanks. You know, it's nice to hear. I don't, <laughs> I kind of like everything else in my life. I don't, I find it really hard to seek help for things. I've done everything I do. I kind of do by myself. Um, and, and that too, like getting off of the substance abuse issue and, and getting back to myself was something I was like, I'm, I'm just going to do it myself and not get any help with it. And, um, I don't know why, <laughs> uh, you know, I've since obviously changed that because here I am, you know, seeking out people who actually have advice and, and know how to help in different ways. And yeah, man. also like working and counseling with a therapist and trying to figure out maybe what the underlying causes of, of getting to that issue were in the first place. So I've changed around a lot of that. Um, but I just wanted to bring that up because I don't know, maybe there's some other people out there who feel like they were the cause. Right. And everyone says no one person is all the cause. Right. It's got to be both of your fault. But like. Maybe, uh, maybe, maybe there's a little bit, but then as I started like doing some of this 
work and looking into it. Number one, like everybody else, I, I made all the mistakes, right? Like the uh, hold not super tight, the begging, the the flowers when you shouldn't be buying flowers, all that stupid <laughs> shit that, that shouldn't have been happening. Yeah. Um, so I did literally everything wrong until I found Steve's book and the classes and all that kind of stuff that were um, able to really give me a little bit of clarity. Uh, and in the weeks, you know, it's only been about a month, right? Since I found the groups and found the books, I've um, been doing a lot of work, a lot of reading. I approach things like a professional student, you know, I, I reading and taking notes and things yeah. like that it just helps me. It puts my mind at ease, but That's to great, know that man. I'm doing yeah. something. That's great. Um, and as I work towards that, I think there's been a shift uh, in that I'm actively not pushing her away anymore, which obviously I was with the behavior at first, right? So we're not living separate we're still in the same house in the same bed things are like civil but there's not a whole lot of interaction as all i'm doing is you know know, not like like a lot of real interaction right just the basics you know um uh, a hello kiss in the morning to kiss good night and then like you know in the middle of the day at different times i'm just kind of i feel like managing emotions right but really working towards um improving my behaviors and improving myself and trying to make sure that my situation, regardless of where this goes, is going to be okay. I mean, that's some of the biggest things I've realized and learned is that, you know, I have to make sure that, you know, moving forward, I have two sons, right? Regardless of what happens here, I I need my life to be good. I need to be okay. And that's what it's going to be, you know, making that mindset change has, has ultimately really calmed me down uh, and, and made it so that I feel good because I really do have the belief that wherever I end up, is going to be a good place. Like, you know, where we're at right now, it can only go up from here, right? It's either going to go up and get better with her or somewhere else down the line, it's going to go up and it's going to be better elsewhere. Right. So, I mean, that has been a, a, a valuable shift in my mindset yeah, I love that it. I think has really calmed things down around here. But I guess if I had a question, it would be like, I, I don't really know what I'm trying to ask. I'm just wondering like, what, how, how long do you kind of like, sit around in a relationship where it feels like everything is stagnant and like when you know um i i don't want you know this is where i want to be right i don't want to make any drastic changes or anything like that but uh i'm just kind of like wondering when or how communication might start i guess we're both you probably say not great communicators you know uh and throughout our seven years of marriage that's probably something that's added up like the substance abuse was an issue for sure but on top of that through reading the books i'm like oh shit i was doing a lot of stuff wrong you know and and maybe we both were in terms of communication so opening that up and figuring out how to open that up i think is my you know issue right now i know it's pretty soon obviously she probably still needs the time but yeah good good let me ask you a couple of questions and this is really sure sorry let's let's dive in it's gonna be fun um real quick i'm gonna (laughs) i'm gonna go over no you're good man i'm gonna go over time a little bit so anybody that needs to bounce off, you can. Otherwise, you know, if you want to stay on with us or you can stay on with us, that would be great. I have maybe five or 10 minutes of, I can keep it fast as far as the points that I was making and things. So I will get to those guys, but um, I want to I want to take care of and take a look at the chat here. So, um, all right. So we're, and pardon my questions. I'm just going to shoot straight, right? Okay. So yeah. she, what, were you using when she met you seven years ago or eight years ago? Um, it, you know, like I would say kind of like at a recreational point, right? Like not anything that was an issue or a problem, but sure. Um, yeah, but like, yeah, it got worse, you know, got worse. Yeah. And by the way, I, you have huge balls for bringing this here and being open and honest about this. And that's fucking awesome. And that's why I'm just addressing it. Like, you know, it's a real thing. Okay. We've all had stuff. Yeah, I know. It's not something i really talk about a lot either so yeah no this is super easy but yeah you're doing great and i don't need to ask like what it was and all that i get the idea and and i'm going toward what you're asking so she met you and i i assumed it was yes so she met you when you were this like super fun guy right like super fun Uh, yeah yeah okay so not just the using but you are a super fun probably kick-ass badass guy who she fell in love with And so now don't try to change all of that. Don't try to change who you are, your personality, the badass kick-ass guy that you are down to your heart and your soul and your balls, because I'm sure that's still there. So you don't need to change those things. But, uh, and I've seen this many, many times. 
And if I'm off base, I apologize, but I've seen this many times where like the whole relationship was really based off of a lot of fun. Right. And so now as of a year and a half ago, maybe obviously. Um, Yeah. I mean, sure. No, no, go on. Sorry. Oh, we're just a little bit delayed. So if I talk over you, I apologize. So a lot of fun and, and then there was drama too. So fun is drama. Okay. So the relationship has been based off of a lot of ups and downs in the past. And then often what happens is when we go, when the guy gets sober, it gets fucking boring. It's like, it's like just deadline, you know, like there's no heartbeat anymore and it's just (laughs) fucking boring dead. And she doesn't want that. That's sound. That's not who she knows you to be. That's, that's a shitty life, so to speak, you know, and we're just kind of day to day, just surviving instead of actually thriving and being a fun person and having a fun life. So finding a way to still to, to again, be a fun person and a fun man and to not be ashamed of your personality, of who you are underneath there, because you don't need, you know, I'm speaking to myself and I'm speaking to every man here. We don't really need the substance to be the fun, awesome dude that comes out, so to speak. It's just that's our gateway. It's our excuse. Yeah. Or like just you're right. And it's easy because it feels good, but we can get ourselves to that feeling spot. Anyway, so that that's that point. Now, your question of so I'm wondering if things the last year and a half just been kind of stagnant and are you two not having i know your kiddos there but are you not having intimacy any longer or you know are you guys kissing you guys fucking like where are we um, in the relationship yeah yeah i mean lately you know not uh, a whole heck of a lot of intimacy i guess like you know a couple you know a few times a month you know something like that but ultimately i think it's down to her um after she said this, obviously things changed even more, right? In that department and brought up how she was feeling and things like that. So not, um, maybe not the best, you know, in that department right now. And yeah, like my kids yeah. are in the room. So. <laughs> I get it. Yeah. So to, to, if I could try to jump to answer your question in a short way, and, and by the way, you can email me if you want to kind of get more into this, right? Yeah. Jeff at great men, move mountains.com or just post on the forum and tag me, right? Like we can, okay. Uh, so to jump to it, um, again, I don't know anything specifically about you or your wife more than what you told me, but the the mm-hmm. hunch is that she feels like life isn't fun anymore. And she does. I she mean, wants, definitely. Sorry. And she wants you to know who you are without the substance, whatever that may be. And so those are two key things. If we don't know who we are as a man, it's really hard to have fun. If we don't know who we are as a man, it's really hard to have a relationship with a woman because we don't really feel confident in having fun, making money, by the way, too, or having a relationship if we don't kind of, quote, know who we are. And it's usually simpler than you think. So if I were to give you homework, I would say, write for five minutes for me, type for 10 minutes for me, who are you in your heart? When you're excited about something in the world, not her, not your kids, but you as a man, when right. you're excited, what it could be music, it could be working out, like make it simple. It could be fucking pumpkin pie, guys, right? And so I talk about pumpkin pie because I love me some pumpkin pie. I could talk all about it. I make pump, I make pumpkin pie. My sister grows pumpkins. She makes pumpkin, pie. you know, it's a family thing. It's fucking delicious. I, I can I can make more jokes about it, but I'll stop. So yeah, who am I as a man is really the crux of all this. And part of who you are is a fun guy. That's why those of us that have had, you know, stuff with, with substances, it's because we really want to have more fun in life. Like we want to experience more aliveness. And the key is who are you at your core that already has that aliveness? And how are you bringing that out in the world without that substance? That's really the crux, I believe, of what you're asking. Is that fair to say? Is that so? Point. Yeah, I think so. I think to say that things have have hit a lull and hit a routine, I think for sure, you know, it would be a, an accurate assessment because, I mean, obviously we're here with a, a five and a two year old too. So in that time period, when you have little kids, you're always kind of falling into a, a routine, but uh, we didn't do a good job, you know, of, of, of keeping up the fun of, of making it about us. And I think a lot of that was due to her kind of slowly pulling away because she didn't like the behavior she saw right out of you know me because i wasn't doing right. the right thing obviously um so you know how to come back and fix that and and get back to a point where we can have fun like we used to like 
I think at my heart, at my core, you know, I'm still what you said, you know, I'm still a guy who enjoys fun. I'm dedicated to things. I'm passionate about things. If I get into something like I have an incredible work ethic, you know, if I literally work out seven days a week, 40 minutes a day, like I have, you know, a drive and a, and a desire to do things that most people don't do or like do hard things. Like I love to do difficult stuff, stuff that people say you can't do. That's what I like to do. All right. So I have that in me. I still have a drive and a passion. Uh, I still think I'm an interesting person without any additional help, you know, uh, but in terms of all that stuff, I think we just kind of lost our way it, probably due to my behaviors. You know, I'm willing to own that for sure. I think I have to own that. Obviously that's part of what you're doing here, but, finding it again seems challenging because you know i don't know does she want to does she not you know that's kind of where i'm at and i'm realizing i just kind of can't you know worry about the outcome or be outcome dependent like i kind of have to just figure out where i'm going and what i'm doing to make my life you know good whatever way it ends up uh and it's easier to say than it is to do, but that's definitely what I'm working toward you know yeah i hear what you're saying so let me give you something practical usually music is a phenomenal yeah. way to bring fun and connection and energy and, you know, emo emotion, usually positive emotion without you having to say anything. So if I were you, mm -hmm. I would say two to three times a week, hopefully when the kids, the kids could be there, but maybe when the kids are not there as well, put on some music and see if she'll dance with you. Now, I don't know if you like this or not, but here, this is the idea, right? Put on some music two or three times a week, different times, sometimes in the middle of the day, sometimes at night, sometime on a Sunday morning at 7 a.m. You know, like mix it up. Don't make it routine. Put on some music and just jam to it yourself for a few minutes and then invite her into that with you, either listening to it or sitting and talking with the music on or dancing. And don't try to do anything else. Don't try to communicate. Don't try to like assuage her or convince her of something. Just be in the moment of the fun and the energy right. with her because that's really what she wants anyway. You know, there, there's more details to this. And if, if you want to talk more, we can, but that's what I would say for the next two months, two to three times a week, put on some music, different times, and invite her into like, you have to feel in a good mood too. Don't do it if you feel like dog shit, right? But yeah. be in a good mood and invite her into that good mood with you two or three times a week over the next two months. And don't try anything else with her. Like, don't try to talk. Don't try to convince her of anything like that. That's what, give that a shot over the next two months. Okay. Yeah. And then come back and tell us how it's going, right? All right. Thanks. I mean, yeah. Glad you're here. Absolutely. Good stuff. Thanks. Appreciate it. Yeah, of course, guys, there's there's a lot of nuance to these things. And I, I don't know his wife and all this. And there's a lot more we could get into, certainly. But really, the core of what we're talking about there is we lost ourselves. We lost our fun. We lost our inspiration that came from within us. And we started to lean on her or we started to suckle at the teat of her validation. And that was a mistake. So I'm going to jump past these core up posts. I had some that were actually funny, but we're over time. So I'm going to jump here to the, to the punchline. I do want to take a look at the chat really fast too, before we get off, get off the call here. So I acted needy and pushed her away. Now what? So don't make, don't make the number one mistake mistake. Most guys make here, which we've been talking about this whole call. It's trying too hard. That's the number one mistake guys make trying to convince her of something, trying to get to the a resolution of a logical intellectual conversation, trying to get her to be sure of something. All those are a huge mistake. How to get intimacy back on track to bedtime fun. Hell, we were just talking about that specifically bring fun into your life and your heart first. You have to feel like you are fun. You have to feel like you have aliveness in your heart and in your own life before she, why would she want anything to do with you if you didn't? And so you, you focus on bringing fun and life back into your own heart and first, and then help her trust you more. This is the theater in your mind we're talking about. It's the mindset hack. So literally in your mind, what's the story? How's the story unfolding? Literally in your mind, when you walk into the kitchen in the morning, how do you see yourself in the theater that's happening? How do you see what she's saying? Don't see it as face value. Don't see it as the words she's literally saying. You guys, we hear this all the time. Okay. Yes, believe her, but with you, she's an emotional being and such and such and all her traumas are coming out and all her trauma. 
Okay. So this is theater with your woman. You are her lover. She is your lover. She's not your mommy. You're not her father. You're not her boss. You're not her teacher. Like stop trying to be those things. Right? You're her lover and see that in your mind. And if you have more questions on that, how to do that or problems there, reach out to me. So real quick, uh, a man on the forum this week mentioned Kafka. And I actually read his Before the Law short story. And this is just a few snippets from that story. Now, if you, I'm going to ruin the punchline here. And so I apologize if you, if you want to go read it, it's still very powerful, or you can just plug your ears right now. But I want to make a point with this as we close out for today. So Kafka, these are all a quote from his Before the Law short story. So before the law, now before the law to me is an analogy or a metaphor in some way, the law could be your desire to feel righteous, righteousness in your life, to uh, get one over on someone else. The law could also be um, your own heart, your own ambition, your own goals in life, where you want to go, some way you want to feel validated in your life outside of you or inside of you, okay? So before the law is an analogy in my eyes. So here we go. Before the law sits a gatekeeper. To this gatekeeper comes a man from the country who asks to gain entry into the law. So he asks to gain entry, but the gatekeeper says that he cannot grant him entry at the moment. The man thinks about it and then asks if he will be able to come in later on. It's possible, says the gatekeeper, but not now. Okay, I'm not going to read the whole thing. These are just excerpts. So that later in, on in the story, now the man no longer has much time to live. The man from the country who's asking for entry, he's older now. He no longer has much time to live. Before his death, he gathers in his head all his experiences of the entire time up into one question, which he has not yet put to the gatekeeper. So through his whole life, he's been asking permission to come in, asking permission to come in. And the gatekeeper has said, no, right? The gate's open. He looks through the gate. He can see that the gate's open, but the gatekeeper keeps saying no. The man waves to the gatekeeper since he can no longer lift up his stiffening body. And to conclude, the gatekeeper has to bend way down to the man for the great difference has changed things to the disadvantage of the man. So time has gone on. He's not youthful anymore. He doesn't have his physical capabilities. He doesn't have time any longer. Maybe he doesn't have as much intellectual capability. And the gatekeeper says, what do you still want to know then? Asked the gatekeeper. You are insatiable. Everyone strives after the law, says the man. So everyone wants something, says the man. So how is it that in these many years, no one except me has requested entry to this gate? The gatekeeper sees that the man is already dying. And in order to reach his diminishing sense of hearing, he shouts at him, here, no one else can gain entry since this entrance was assigned only to you. I'm going to now close it because the man is dying. So in my eyes, it's us trying to get permission from some kind of gatekeeper to enter into some goal, path, inspiration within ourselves. We're looking for acceptance or approval or validation or, you know, the go ahead from something outside of us instead of taking the fucking step ourselves, instead of throwing the spear at the buffalo that we want to hunt, instead of saying we want pumpkin pie, instead of saying we want to kiss her passionately or we want to fuck her this weekend, we're afraid and we're asking permission. And of course, the gatekeeper is going to say no. If you're the kind of man that is afraid, then you're not ready to enter that gate. All right. Okay. Now, be healthy, guys. Be smart. If you have questions on any of this, absolutely let me know. Uh, that, that'll close us out for today. I'm going to look at the chat really fast. If you want to reach out to me again, there's my contact stuff I'll put into the chat too. Appreciate you guys being here. And if I don't see you again, have a phenomenal rest of your year. Otherwise, I'm sure I'll see you on many roundtable calls, guys. Let's take a look at the chat. I've always been the husband who will volunteer to run an errand for my wife. I would happily go pick up groceries, drop off mail at the post office. 
I'd happily bring her a snack. This was before she dropped the bomb. Ever since the bomb, if I try to do the same things I did before, it's met with suspicion. It was not manipulation before she dropped the bomb. It was me just being me. After the bomb, it was still just be me being me, regardless of how she chooses to frame it. So yeah, a, a woman will push back against you if you are doing things she feels you shouldn't be doing for her. Like if you're not in a relationship with her anymore, if she says, I love you, but I'm not in love with you, in her mind, again, the old relationship is dead. So if you're still doing all the same things, she thinks you're not fucking getting it, bro. Like you're not getting it. So why do you keep doing all these same things? That's where the suspicion comes in is because in her mind, the relationship isn't in the same place. So why are you still doing those things? Now to you, you're being a gracious man. And so Anthony, if you and I were talking, which we don't have time for today, how do you, dif how do you differentiate yourself when you're a lover with someone versus other people in the world? Because there's not a lot of differentiation within you as who you are when you're a lover. And those are questions that we could talk about, you know, down the road. Another question, is it a good idea to share beyond success and failure uh, with my wife? No, like sharing any of these books with your wife will seem like manipulation, like criticism to her. She'll take it as she's doing something wrong, like she needs to be fixed. Uh, I'm, I would never say lie to her. If she asks you about the book, tell her what the book is, like whatever. But no, don't try to get your wife to read your guy books. That's not a good idea. Uh, we could talk more about like what to do instead and all that kind of things. Based on the bazooka, is it a good idea to state the wants to see where she is at? Is she interested or showing things? Is she interested or is she showing like she already checked out of the relationship? Yeah. So the strategy is a dance. So it's one step forward, one step back, two steps forward, one step back. So I said, put on music and try to dance with her or bring her into the music a couple times a week. I have no idea what they are, but I would guess from what he described, that's one step forward. So if she says, I'm not dancing with you, you know, like, Oh, how dare you? Well, that gives him information that he could take to his coach and we could talk more, but you don't want to just go to zero and stay at zero for lots of reasons we've talked about. So yeah, for yourself, estimate where she's at. And like I said, with Dan, I want to kiss, I want to take a bath with you later on and kiss you passionately on the mouth. So yeah, you know, aim for one step up the staircase and see how it goes and then come back and ask for feedback from the group or from me. Yeah. Uh, gaslighting. Yeah. We're not going to talk about the word gaslighting on this call. That's like, I'm not a fan of labels and that's a whole thing. That's like a whole other thing. Let's see. I used to be fun around her, but that wasn't, that was all an expression of sexual energy. Mm. That energy started to be shamed and criticized after we got married. So it's hard to express that around her now. I have to bring that out. Yeah. Bring that out somewhere else. When we've been shamed for something, we absolutely have to go through a healing, healing practice for ourselves, usually outside of that relationship. And I've absolutely been through that sexual been sexually shamed in the past and then had erection issues and all kind of stuff that I worked myself through. And I could talk about that another time I have before. So yeah, when we're, for, when we're shamed for something, especially because you're a good man, you're not a narcissist, you know, <laughs> like you're not an actual psychopath, narcissist, narcissist wouldn't give a fuck like a psychopath or a narcissist, you know, would not give two shits if someone accused you of something. So since you actually care, by the way, guys, that means you're not a narcissist. <laughs> like that's, a whole, that's a whole other thing. I don't want to get off on a tangent here. Um, sexual energy. So yeah, this it's sort of, can I be fun and can I be a sexual man in an appropriate way that isn't just to this one and only woman? And if I, usually what happens then is if she denies a reciprocation, we get butt hurt because it's like, well, I'm hungry and she's not into it. And, that, and then you're like, whoa, blah, blah, and then we get butt hurt, and it's a downward spiral after that. So she does not have to reciprocate being fun. She does not have to reciprocate sex. She doesn't have to reciprocate shit. And so that's really the starting point is she doesn't have to do anything. We're doing it because we want to, and maybe we need to take that elsewhere, fun in life. I don't mean sex with other women necessarily, but practice talking with other women, practice socializing with other people. Absolutely. She wants more fun. 
She says, I'm not open to new experiences. I'm a wet, I'm a wet blanket. You know, I guess I'll leave with this. A lot of this, there's a grain of truth in almost everything. And that's painful to our ego sometimes, you know, guys, and that's okay. And that's real. And that's life. And if you can have a little smile, if you have a little smile on your face, like, yeah, I fucked up and ate your leftovers. I'm sorry. You know, if you can have a little smile on your face, yeah, you're right. I'm not as fun as I used to be. Or yeah, you're right. I shouldn't have, I'll make a joke, George. I shouldn't have talked for 45 minutes about my work. I shouldn't have talked about the hot nurse that I saw at work. I don't know. Like, yeah, we make mistakes. It's okay. Stop trying to appease her, right? Only buy her flowers when things are going good. Otherwise, just be an amazing man. Fill your life and your heart with joy. I'll see you guys in the forum. Reach out to me if you like. Appreciate you guys. Have an awesome rest of your weekend. Ciao, guys.